Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think this is probably the last session. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, dependable C++. Um, on Monday, you went to Yannis' talk on how we can write good C++ using C++14, what we have today, uh, with assistance from, from tools. And the emphasis is on good, safe, correct, um, and, uh, and efficient. Right. Now, um, we hope that we don't write bugs, but we do. Um, so what happens when you get bugs? Uh, ideally, we would like the system not to do something too different from what it's supposed to do. A web browser is supposed to let you browse, not give access to intruder, okay? Um, and Neil uh, just gave two talks back to back on um, how uh, you know, the tools that we use to, uh, to enforce guidelines and, and how we enforce C++, C++ and he went into deeper details about the array views, string views, and other. So I tend to call all these classes the, the safe buffer types, right? You have string view, array view, it's a buffer, and, and you want to have safe access. Uh, what I call dependable system is a system that may not be probably correct, may have some bugs, but when you run into the bugs, the, the behavior is somehow contained. You know, if you, if you click on the wrong link on the web site, you shouldn't have your hard drive reformatted. Okay, that, that, that kind of stuff. Um, so, the now, the interesting thing he did in, in his talk, and I actually like Locke did the talk, was to show how using uh, type, C++ semantics, race semantics for types, you can actually capture many of the annotations that were developed originally for C, right? If you're writing C, you don't have much help, right? But if you're writing C++, now you introduce your classes, you do invariants, and, and you know, the compiler can, can understand, and you don't get any performance hit as he showed in the last, uh, last talk. Um, th there are situations where you don't have much choice, but you, you know, like you have binary compatibility issues. You cannot replace array view, um, oh, sorry, your pointer life with array view. You have to retain T star and N. And yes, you can put owner, but you still want to have some runtime check or at least help the analysis tools, whether it is compile time or link time. Prefix, for example, is something that, you know, kind of link time, load time uh, analysis. Um, the, the idea here is that um, we should find ways to complement uh, the strong types with something that is boundary between, you know, compile time and runtime with uh, very light wave, uh, you know, footprint, okay? Uh, but for that, the problems we're trying to solve is how we design our interfaces, right? That's all the Ernest talk was about, the talk was about. So what is an interface? If you look at the core guidelines, um, uh, you know, it, it says that an interface is a contract between two parts of the program. You have the consumer and have the producer. So um, if you're able to precisely state the requirements of your interface, then you can actually get help from you know, the compiler, from the tool chain. So here you have this notion of, of contract. And if you haven't yet, I really encourage you to go to the uh, guidelines website and, and you just read that first paragraph and a bunch of other cool stuff in there, right? And, and I will be coding a lot from the, from the guidelines. So you can think of this talk as a, a motivation for why we need to improve the language to better support what we believe is good style, good programming style. So um, the, essentially having, you know, turning your comment into something that's more formal, you know, executable is always good. You will not be able to state your requirements always as code, but when you can, try so that you can get help from the tools, okay? So um, this is not new. 
there have been a lot of work in this area of uh, you know, you know, con programming contract general, uh, but also for C++ or X, there were a lot of folks, you know, a lot of interest from the standards uh, committee uh, to, to have a form of contract in C++ or X. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't get in there uh, because what we had, some thought it was too complex, or some thought it didn't go far enough. In the end, if you don't get a consensus, you don't move. That's the way it is. You know, every time you have to get something into the language, you have to create consensus. It is far easier to do nothing than to do something. Um, now, after C++ uh, 11 went out, we got renewed interest in getting contract because the problem didn't go away just because we didn't get contract in C++ 11, right? The problem is still there. And with the guidelines, now, now that we have, you know, Written down what we believe is a good programming style, and also have the guideline support library. It becomes clear where we need this notion of contract. When you take a review, for example, uh, all the talks didn't show uh, contract, but I'll uh, shortly show you where contract notion actually is occurring in the interface. Okay, um, so there are a lot of work. Um, in, in, in the C++, let's say 14 or 17 time frame, there have been a lot of uh, proposals. Uh, John Lakos and his team uh, have been you know, pushing uh, for contracts. Uh, they have a lot of papers. I think the latest is Revision 11. You know, they sustain uh, interest in there. And uh, on, you know, on the uh, Microsoft side, of course, we have static analysis tools, not just static, but also dynamic analysis. And, and folks from um, uh, Facebook, so Francesco Lugoso, uh, he's one of the leading experts in, in static analysis. He's at, at uh, uh, Facebook, uh, folks from Google. Uh, Manuel Fendrich, he's, he's at, uh, at Google. Um, uh, you know, folks from Spain. So this is you know, conglomerates of folks who have uh, common interest in getting contract into the language. Um, so the papers out there, what I'm going to talk about is not a representation of their views. This is just my view, so I'm not speaking for them. And uh, if I say something wrong, please don't attribute this to them. This is my personal view. Okay. So uh, we have this contract metaphor, which usually uh, involves uh, two parties, right, or more. And, and contracts have clauses. So here's uh, something that's, you know, this is a metaphor. So, you know, went and, and looked at the, uh, the you know, lawyers know a lot about contract, right? <laughs> that's where it come from. Uh, so, you know, here I have uh, um, it's kind of explanation of what a contract clause is. Uh, it says the specific provision or section within a written contract. So here there is a notion that you have to write something down. Okay. It's, it didn't say whether right, you have to write something down. And each clause in, in a contract addresses a specific aspect to, related to the subject matter of the agreement. Something that's quite important here is that a contract clause is aimed at clearly defining the duties, the rights, and privileges of each party that has its, not, not, not the agreement on the contract. So. Um, the contract is something that you, you know, between at least two you know, parties, right, where you have, you know, you have expectations, but you also have duties, and, and it clearly specifies what, what goes on. Um, in the context of programming language, um, you know, we have several kinds of contracts, what we call the precondition, essentially you want to call a function. Well, you can call that function only if certain requirements are met. In return, the function will perform uh, some action on your behalf. So that's the privilege that you get from, uh, you know, the, you, you can, if you meet the requirement, then you get the privilege, which is the post condition. And then while the, um, the action being performed on your behalf or while you're calling other functions on an object, you have certain things that remain invariant, right? So for example, if you have a polymorphic class that creates an object of a polymorphic class, you know at point of construction that the dynamic type of that object, you know what it is. An invariant is that the dynamic type of that object will not change during the lifetime of that object. Between construction and destruction, the V table, you know, wants to 
pop implementation, the V table doesn't change. So that is you know, a guarantee you have during you know, the lifetime of the object. That's an example of invariance. Uh, in this talk, um, I will talk only about preconditions and postconditions, mostly because invariant fallout from, from the rest. They are slightly more complicated to get you now at the implementation level. But the most important aspects are preconditions, postconditions. When you get those two, then invariants, you know, kind of follow. So um, what's precondition uh, from you know, concrete uh, interface design point of view? You know, so you have two parties. So essentially, you have a consumer, and then you have a producer. So when you look at an interface, precondition in the interface from the consumer's perspective is, what are the requirements that I need to meet before I can make a call? Okay, that's precondition. And from the implementer's perspective, it, what can I assume in the implementation of the operation? So for example, with square roots, that takes double, returns double. The requirement, the precondition is that you have a non-negative value that you want to take square root off. The implementer of that operation can expect, can assume that, and then efficiently deliver that operation to you. Of course, we always say trust but verify, right? So whether the implementer additionally trusts you but verifies the, uh, the, the, the condition is kind of left, uh, can be left uh, uh, unspecified. Now, back to the guidelines. The guideline is a little bit more concrete, it says, so this is I-5. This is not the highway from Canada that goes to, uh, uh, to Portland. This is the uh, reference to the, uh, no, it's the reference to the, uh, the rural number is I-5. Uh, so it's, you know, it says always states the precondition, if any. And it gives an example, which was the, uh, um, the square root example I you know, started with earlier. So, Essentially, the argument must be uh, non-negative. Okay? Uh, you could state that in the comments. Uh, great, get someone to read it, fantastic. But it is better if your comment is in a form that is uh, mechanically enforceable, right? We love compilers, right? The US errors. You want the compiler to, to check this as well as it can. Right. So the guideline says, well, use expect. So there is this uh, support uh, macro in the GSL that gives you, you know, uh, you know expect you can use to, uh, to state um, uh, preconditions. Uh, today, the C14 we have today is not uh, expressive enough for us to express that precondition in the declaration. So part of this effort on, on, on contract is to see what can we do? How we can we get that support in the language so that we can write directly what we mean? Um, sometimes you cannot write um, you know, preconditions in, in the language we have because the language is not expressive. Though. Well, in those cases, it's okay to state them in, in comment, but always prefer a, a, mechani you know, a form that can be mechanically uh, verified or, or enforced. Um, uh, the other thing is that uh, when you have a, a class, after construction, the constructors set up an invariant, set up the environment for all member functions to, uh, to operate. So I uh, can think of you know, the, the, the thing that happens after construction as some kind of uh, you know, invariant. And that invariant is also a precondition for every member function you want to call, right? Because you, know, you have to have an object of that type before you can make a call. So for every member function, the, you know, the invariant that are set by the constructors become precondition for that member function. And we don't have to repeat them because, well, that's what the types are for. The classes are there to capture uh, that kind of uh, invariant. And, and, and the tools can use them to, uh, to, to verify what, what's going on. 
Uh, okay, what else do we get from the, uh, from the guidelines? Uh, I6, the post condition. Right. Sorry, no, this is not post condition. This is a pre oh, got lost in my own slides. No, it's, um, it's still preconditions. It says, prefer, expect to state um, preconditions. Okay. If you don't have expect that the, uh, the GS that is giving you, normally what you'll do is you just test manually your, your condition and then either raise an exception or collaborate or something that effect. When you do that, what you've done is you've taken a, a very high level recognizable idea and then turn it into some very low level, a lot of code that is very hard to recognize as precondition and also very hard for tools to recognize and do their job. That's why we want you to actually use the, uh, not the, um, the expect macro, um, uh, can only have its macro for now um, in your function. So this is just an example of good, uh, what you want you, that if, if you want to compute the array, uh, the area of a, a rectangle, we assume that a rectangle has uh, you know, uh, positive eights and, and, and width. So you say, I expect the eights and width to be positive, as opposed to, well, it is, if it is non-positive or if the other guy is, the other side is also non-positive, then execute my error. That's just too long and you know, doesn't say directly what you want in code. Now, here is something quite interesting. Ideally, uh, precondition should be part of the interface, but we don't have the language facility for that. And just a term that I want to, I want to repeat. Um, the getting that into the language is not easy. The ideas are simple. I hope I'll convince you of the ideas. Uh, getting language support for it is not easy. Well, you have the technical aspect, and then you have also the social aspects, and then you have the educational aspect too. Um, so finally, one more thing about the, uh, uh, the, the expect uh, you know, macro. Um, you could say, well, if we know that something is uh, a precondition, shouldn't we just ask the compiler to go through the body of a function and then warn us when we say assert something, that logically should be a precondition. That's a good idea on paper, but in practice, it just doesn't make a lot of sense because if you make a warning, what else happens? We don't have the language facility to, you know, to actually take advantage of it. So it sounds interesting, but not in, in, in practice. Now, post conditions. Um, they essentially the dual of, of preconditions. So for, from for, uh, post condition from the user's perspective, the consumer's perspective, uh, the question is, if I make a call, imagine I have meet the requirements, I make a call, like a sort, what am I getting in return for making the effort to meet the requirement? That's from the consumer's perspective, okay? And from the implementer's perspective, okay, uh, the user made the effort to be a good citizen. What do I have to do before this function return to the call? Okay, so that's post condition. And what a post condition is essentially, a, you know, a, a, some kind of predicate that relates the state of the computation before the, the call is initiated, and the states of the machine when the, the return, the call, the control goes back to the uh, to the caller. So, for example, if input, I got vectors of int, and they're all good ints in range, um, and then we have to sort, and I have to meet some requirement, which is that I have to sort the vectors, I cannot take things out, right? This is the post condition. So all I have is that I can only permit the elements in the vector in a way that's either decreasing or increasing, or based on some sorting or So that is something that I, as an implementer, has to satisfy for the sort function, for example post condition after you make a call. Something that the caller is guaranteed to have. Okay, any questions so far? No, okay. So, uh, have contracts. That means, you know, you have parties, have obligations, they have rights, and, and so forth. So, 
Uh, what good is a contract if you do not have an enforcer? Say differently, what happens when you breach contract? If, you, if you, there is no penalty, then you can just ignore all the time, right? It means nothing. Well, when you're lucky, your program just crashed. Or sometimes if you're a big corporation, you get bad press, right? You leak, you know, have some security vulnerabilities, and um, you know, the user data gets out, and you get into real trouble. Uh, most seriously, people die. It happens frequently, right? When you uh, just think of medical devices, if you have a bug in pacemaker, when you have your, you know, in surgery, something happened, someone died. It's, it's very serious. Um, the way we capture all of these things in this standard is to say, oh, you have undefined behavior. And someone will tell you, oh, demons will fly out of your nose. Guess what? These days, they literally do, right? Um, we have a lot of documented um, cases where um, you know, something that was expected didn't hold, and the compiler just assumed that, oh, you will never dereference and null pointers, therefore, if you dereference, then you do the check here. I could just go ahead and delete that code because, well, you dereference before, therefore, it was not null, right? You're not supposed to dereference a null pointer and store uh, stuff there. And compilers have been doing this more and more, and it's become a nightmare, you know. It, it, how do you write dependable software when there is no way to hold people accountable, right? Or you know, mechanically ensure that um, if someone does something bad, the behavior is still restricted. That's what we're after. So in fact, we're going after a lot with abstraction in the language, okay? Uh, to support uh, contract. C++ is big. It's, if you took the totality, Right, so we don't want to make it bigger. We want to make it more effective. So it ought to be lightweight. We can't go after dependent types or any of those exotic types that uh, you use to write academic papers. Um, so we want direct language support. The language has to provide direct semantics to you know, these preconditions and post conditions. And um, we need the tools to understand these semantics. It's very important. Not just the compiler, not just the code optimizer, but the analysis tools. You know, I hope you appreciated Neil's talk. You understand you know, all the things you can do, even if you're not generating code. Um, and we want to foster new programming paradigm. Right? No. If, if people can trust the API, and know that if they do something wrong, the behavior will be contained. Then a lot of um, ugly or clever stuff that you find on the web just disappear, right? There is no need to be clever anymore. You can just write something simple and trust the tools to help you if you stray away, okay? Um, yeah, we want to contain undefined behavior. Undefined behavior, the way it is defined in standard is say, well, um, if you fail these and other conditions, then the current, the, this international standard does not place any uh, restriction or obligation on the compiler, okay? So the compiler is free not to accept your code or accept your codes and just crash or just assume that, well, you are not actually a, an ignorant. You're always perfect, very clever. So anything you write is true. I'm just going to take that as a fact and optimize the rest. That's how we get into a lot of trouble, okay? So we want to contain undefined behavior. We want these contract facilities to say, well, this is what you assume. And if you get it wrong, please make sure that we don't do something unrelated to the, the, the work that we're doing. And of course, we want to do this without overhead. This is the ideal. This is the goal. Okay? Um, if I want to use Python or Java or C Sharp, I know where it is. I'm not trying to turn C++ into Java or C Sharp. There is a core of C++ that is safe. That is where we, what we are after. So what are the principles? Um, whatever we do, if we make 
assert, C assert from assert of H, attractive, then we have failed. You might think it is easy, but in fact, no. It is easy to look at individual examples, try to find uh, you know, language feature that um, satisfies several you know, conditions, kind of you know, specialized, and end up with something so complicated that um, assert looks so beautiful with no danger. Right. We know that assert is source of ODR violation, and that's why most of the time we don't use them. In fact, we use something slightly different, more complicated. We want to provide direct language support that replaces assert much simpler, much safer. Um, also, we don't really, really want to start um, modifying a type system or allow you to do some kind of overloading on preconditions and, and postconditions. If it's a Monday, please call that function. If it's a Tuesday, call this other one, and then you have to throw dice to, to check which one you, you want to call. Now, remember, if you have a correct program, you feed that program with correct data, you don't actually need to evaluate the precondition, right? From program observer perspective. You need to do those kind of check only when you get into you know, you know, bugs, you know, areas that you didn't think of or someone feeds you with you know, data that are out of contract. That means that we cannot change the type system. Right? We cannot do it in a way that passes with no valid resolution or other funky template argument deduction. No. Because we want to be able to erase contract checking for correct programs and, and good input. When we know the system, we've tested now that, well, these conditions with these data, we know it is what happened. Then we, we must be able to erase the contracts evaluation or whatever they are and, and get the same behavior. Okay. So um, that gives us to how will we express this? If you take C++11, it has this notion of attribute. And my Stroman proposal is let's just use attribute notation. The way we get attributes into the standard is to say, well, uh, if you have an attribute and the compiler doesn't understand it, the compiler could ignore it, and you still get correct program, and it will give you the same program as if the compiler understood the, the attribute in the first place. So you have this notion of uh, semantics transparency that, you know, if you remove the attribute, if the original program with attribute is correct, then you take that program and you remove the attribute, it should also be correct. And if you execute both, it should give you a level of the same a level of observer behavior. Okay, so we are squarely right in there. Um, so here's an example of how you would use, uh, you know, precondition with this syntax. Um, um, I have two screens and um, so the, the main part here is you take a review. So this is my array view, that's why it's all capitalized now, it's just so that you don't confuse with GSL array view. And the indexing operator, I expect that the argument to index into the array is inbound, right? So that's what, you know, the, the, the part that's white. It's, oh, so the, the index is positive and it is inbound. The, uh, in abstract, um, when you call that index, you know, the you know, index into a review, like uh, you know, uh, view bracket uh, two, well, conceptually, the compiler will check whether two is inbound. Here it is because the review is indexing, you know, it's providing view into a vector with length, you know, four. So that's, that's good. Then later down, you say, well, I, you know, give me the, uh, the tenth element uh, of that view. Well, sorry, you can't, because we took a view only over four elements. Instead of letting that crash, you, sorry, crash in, or do something unexpected, it will actually terminate the program predictably. Okay? So conceptually, there is a, a runtime check here. It could be compile time. Okay? But, there is a conceptual check. And if you have tested your program, and with all the input, you know the input sets, the data sets, then you can actually tell the compiler, well, 
We've tested, we know the input sets, and don't bother checking this. Okay. You will not have to change the source code. You, will not, you just have to compile with flag that says, oh, don't check. Okay. But you have the same source code. This is very different from assert. Assert injects code, source code, because this is a macro that expands to something, right? So you know, this is not subject to ODR violation. Yesterday I talked about ODR violation. This form is not, because the ODR restriction is a restriction on the input source. You have to have the same source. Remember, Dennis Street, you said it is as if you have only one section of definition for, for a function or for, for, uh, um, for code. So for post conditions, so post conditions are things that are guaranteed after execution of the, the function or operation and before control is you know, transferred back to you. And this includes constructors. For, so here for the array view, one of the things that I'm guaranteed when I construct an array view is that the data pointer of the array view is the same as the data pointer from the vector and I'm taking view on, right? And also the, uh, the, the length, you know, the, the span of the view is the one that I'm given at the construction time. So that is expressed right there. Even if you don't have the body right there, the body of the constructor right there, you know, in the translation unit. You do have this contract that whatever the uh, constructor is doing, you guarantee that it, it's aliasing to the start of the vector and that the view is the one you give, you know, this argument, right? So this is really, really important, especially for analysis tools, right? It doesn't have the body. You, you, you can't expect, if you want to do this at scale, Right, this is very important. You want to do this at scale. You can't expect the tools to go and fetch every function body, analyze them before coming back to you and telling you that you use that uh, constructor correctly. So, in a sense, a contract is also a summary of what an operation is doing. Right, it's part of contract. So, in particular, on this slide, when you're doing the loop. Uh, the analysis tool knows exactly what is aliasing what. Optimizer might take advantage of it, but here my focus is on the analysis tools. Okay, you get the set of you know, aliases, what is aliasing what. Uh, Neil showed earlier what the optimizer can do if it knows what is global, what is not global, what is changing, what is not changing. Here you have another instance of that coming in. So you actually, by stating formally the contract, the preconditions and postconditions, you're making it easier for the tools to work at scale, but also for the optimizer to generate good code for you. Okay. Now, uh, what is the, the semantics of the precondition? The, the semantics of this, you start by evaluating the argument. Right, that's the first thing you do. Next is you, you know, the compiler evaluates the condition of the precondition. Um, if the, that's a predicate, you know, something that returns true or false. If it is false, then you are out of contract and, you know, some countermeasure is deployed. It could be abort through an exception or some other action or just ignore, depending on, you know, your, your setting. Um, then uh, control is transferred to the, the, the definition of the operation, to the, the first statement of the function. Okay, that's, that's the, uh, the semantics for precondition. For post conditions, you have something similar. So essentially, it executes the part of the body that leads to return something. You evaluate the, um, the, the return expression. And then you evaluate the condition of the post, condi uh, the, the, the post condition. Uh, if it holds true, you're good to go. If it holds false, then again, a countermeasure is deployed. Okay, it could be abort, fail fast, throw an exception if you're in some kind of testing or you know that in that case, well, so if something goes wrong, then just tell me because the operation is too deep to know what is going on. So you can raise an exception. Um, uh, you can just say, well, ignore, and someone else's problem is not my problem. Uh, so those are essentially the semantics of what, you know, um, 
we, we expect from the preconditions and, and the post-conditions. Now, a word on the invariance. Say earlier that I won't talk a lot about invariance. So the invariance are essentially things that hold before and after. So really, we can think of them as if you can handle preconditions and post-conditions, then we can handle invariant. Have slight complications, but you don't have to worry about that. Now, naturally, here I say check, check precondition, check post-conditions, then I know we are C++ programmers. We like to take the last the bits of efficiency out of anything. So natural question. Uh, do you check my contract all the time? So in Neil's array view, yes, they check the array bound all the time. You cannot turn it off. Uh, but in more general programming setting, it is not obvious that always checking is the right thing to do. So um, the, you know, there is provision for uh, folks to turn off, depending on, on, the, uh, on the conditions. And, environment. Um, so if you can turn it off, um, do you get to write turn off in the source code? The answer is no. We don't actually want you to go and say, oh, I'm going to call that function, and I'm super smart, I know what it is, so please compile, don't check this call I'm going to make. Um, uh, if we do that, then we start making a cert look very, very beautiful. The next thing you know is you have a bunch of hash if def, right? C plus macros, and it becomes a nightmare, right? So uh, in this view, in this proposal, you, you don't get to, to write in the source code, uh, please check this, please don't check. But what you expect you will be able to do is when you compile a translation unit, the source file, you'll be able to say, oh, well, check the calls in this, in this file. So think you're building debug check of retail, right? So you can, you can build an entire component that's checked, an entire component that's debug or, or retail. Um, now, if you can do that, uh, yes? Oh, the... The, so the, the attributes that, you know, you can put attribute, uh, don't check a bound or something like that? Do you remember Biani? Oh, uh, Herb's talk. Oh, yeah, so Herb's talk was, uh, <laughs> I th no, if I, if I remember Herb's talk correctly, I may be wrong, okay? Uh, I think it was about the tools. You want to suppress the tool from emitting warning on some construct that formally is forbidden by a profile, but you know that it is okay, or for that, you know, for that circumstance, it is okay. You still want to make that call without getting a warning from the tool. So this one is, you know, it's not the same as turning on or off the contract. You, you know, the function. <laughs> Has that con makes that assumption it's about its argument anyway. Whether, whether you write in source code, please don't check. The function is still making those assumptions, right? It's still whole. So they, they, I think they're different uh, issues. Okay, so um, if, if you can build translation units separately, one that is checked, the other one that is unchecked and, and so forth, can I mix them? Well, it's a natural thing to do, right? You know, at least to ask or imagine. Uh, it's, it's a novel concept from the language design perspective. Right? The language design, it just says, oh, you have one, one definition. Oh, so what do you mean mixing? Does that mean that I can call the same function that's checking one translation but unchecking another translation unit? You know, what is it? So it is novel. But in practice, if you're careful enough, you might be able, you know that the data represented the same, and you know that, well, debug is just going to insert some assert or something. You know, in practice, it works, right? But from language design perspective, it's a real challenge. How, how do you get to uh, describe that in a way that is safe, right? We want to provide something that is safe. That's why we're, we want contract. We want, you don't want contract to give you something that is uh, 
unsafer, right? I don't know what to say. Uh, so we want to something that is, that, that is safe to use. Okay. Um, so that, that essentially gives you the overview of what the contract effort is about. You know? uh, give you something that, is, that makes programming much easier uh, for checking, write better C++, um, and move you away from the assert, you know, C style assert, um, and, and, and move comment to something that's more mechanically, uh, mechanically, um, sorry, mechanically enforced. Okay, move. No. It doesn't mean that the pre and post conditions replace comment. You still have your comment, but now you're able to express the comment in something that's more formal than the informal English we use. Even even the starter is not principal enough or disciplined enough to to express all the things. That's why we have a long list of, of bugs, right? So having the, the ability to express your requirement or what you get in return of being good citizen, uh, you know, uh, in, in a way that you know amenable to uh, uh, to tooling is is important. So, question: When can I get it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a good question. Um, you'll get it in an update of Dev14, at least in the Microsoft compiler. However, we're still working out the details of the design. Like I said at the beginning, uh, you have several people working on, on contracts. You have ideas coming from uh, John Nichols. I think he's given talks on defensive programming using contract. That's you know, one practice of, of programming my contract. And uh, I'm in, you know, this working with these people who value a lot static analysis, you know, the benefit that it brings. So there you have, you know, you want the ability to say things that can be checked or taken advantage of at compile time. So we need to marry uh, those point of views before we, you know, we, we put in the standard. But an implementation is you know, being worked on in the uh, Microsoft compiler. I can't tell you exactly when you get it. All I can tell you is you get it in some updates of the 14 compiler. Okay. Um, I'm ready to take questions. Yes. Well, one of the questions I had, maybe I just missed what you said, was um, I noticed the language that you used or the syntax. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, that is C++ today. The and, yeah, it's, it's a keyword in C++. We, we, we like squiggles. So we say, you know, squiggle, squiggle. But you can also say and, you know, it's a personal style. I like or and and not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so as long as we can build a predicate, okay. and, and you know, if you can write that predicate down today, you can use expect as we say in the, in the guideline. Uh, when we got the language support, the syntax, the only thing you have to do probably is just to turn that assert yeah, to, into, uh, into the bracket, but it will work the same. Um, question? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, uh, so the question is: Assume that uh, you know frequently I have this data structure vector that from time to time is sorted, and my team members know that it's sorted, but it is not guaranteed to be sorted, and and then they use that as an input to another operation that expects its argument to be sorted. Is there a mechanism to flag that? Did I get that question correctly? Uh, so, the if you have a function 
that its precondition says I expect no is solid. You have a predicate is solid. You put that as a precondition, and and then you make a call. Then you guarantee that at runtime in a check build you will get that uh, predicate validated. And if the vector is not solid, then it's terminated either abort or exceptions. Right. So you have this. The checks will happen at runtime because this predicate is. It's most likely very runtime, and the data you're getting there at runtime, so it cannot be evaluated at compile time, right? Unless you have some kind of, you know, std array that uh, is solid, it is known to be solid. But most of the time, your data is going to be runtime, and the predicate is going to be evaluated at runtime. But they will be able to make a call, but they won't go very far, <laughs> right? <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. So there, um, I lost. There, there, and there. So uh, I often find that I want to express the closed conditions of function in the function that we are familiar with. Yes. So the the uh, the uh, the question is that usually when you have a post condition, it involves both the value of the parameters before the function start execution and the value at the end of the function. And during the presentation, I didn't mention anything to that effect. Do I have a solution for that? Yes, I didn't get into the details, but the proposals will actually allow you to take to express in the post conditions the what we call the old value, the value of the parameters at the entry and and, and, and relate that to the uh, to the end of the function. I think I go there and then I come back to you. Okay, so um, for third party libraries that were written without contract support, is there a way to impose a contract on existing interfaces? So the question is, is there a way to impose a contract on existing um, library. Um, Try find a question. What, what, what do you mean impose? Did you require or you want to add the annotation? So, so let's say that we have this, uh, this syntax. Yes. Uh, this attribute syntax for contracts. Yes. Uh, and we want to impose a contract. I know that a library I use has certain invariants, but they are not expressed mm -hmm. in the contract system. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, no, I find the, the question is, no, you have this library, you only have the binary and the header file, I assume. Uh, you can't go and modify the source code, but you can put annotations on, on, the, on the declarations. Um, is, is there a way you can impose that so that the tools can take advantage of it? Um, that's getting into an aspect of a design that we haven't settled on yet. My favorite answer would be yes, which is that essentially these uh, checks are done at the call side so that the implementation, you know, you can have it independently. And when you make a call, it's at the call side that we actually make the check. So if you impose this contract on your library and you, you use it, and when you compile it, the compiler says at the call side, oh, oh, hey, this function actually happens to have this declaration. The, the tools, the analysis tools also see the, the, uh, the contract at the call site and can take advantage of it. I, I do not know yet how to do that uh, when the checks are done systematically in the body of a function, which will make your scenario impossible, or close to impossible. Uh, I think I have you. And Yeah, so the question is, uh, for virtual functions, uh, is there any provision to, uh, to state that you cannot uh, strengthen, which means that you, you cannot you know, require more than, 
what, what is uh, in, in Kenyan weekend. The, the, the proposal that we put, you know, it's a collective effort that we put out uh, back in May, say, well, for simplicity, uh, you cannot sign up on Kenyan weekend. You have to be, you have the same contract. Uh, that can be a problem for certain people, but I'm still looking for simplicity and for simplicity reasons. No, you can't strengthen and you can't uh, weaken. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So, bug on the slides. This is what happens when you don't type check your code. <laughs> That's another solution if it is practical. Jonathan? Oh, well, that actually is the, uh, so the question is, uh, what are the plans for having a static verifier Telling the compiler, hey, uh, we can prove this to be uh, to be true. You don't have to, to check. That's actually the implementation plan. Uh, you know, in uh, Neil's uh, talk earlier, the last one on a review, he talked about run check. Okay, so imagine that the real review that would come out when you have contract will have that annotation. Now the optimizer already has ways to know that certain things are true. That's why they optimize stuff. So this is one of yeah, the, the instances. It is not required, but we expect uh, implementations to just have, take advantage of a very simple analysis that they're already doing to prove away uh, contracts so that they don't have to emit the runtime check. Yes? Uh, you'd already mentioned that you have access to uh, parameter values uh, mm -hmm. when you're doing your insurers. Yes. I imagine there's a similar provision for getting at the actual in, in the post conditions, yes, yeah. yes. What, what, other, what other things are, are fair game in the scope of the insure statement? Are, 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 are local variables just a function on the insurers in, in play? Are global variables in play? So the local variables are not visible in the post conditions. Uh, anything that is global is, of course, visible. Uh, so there is one restriction in the, um, the proposal that was put out for the next meeting was that you cannot um, use uh, non-accessible members in the precondition. So you cannot private members or protect the functions, you know, anything has to be, uh, yeah, uh, yes. And how about exceptions? Is there, any, is there anything in there for exceptions? Uh, yeah, so I, I forgot to say something more general, which is that the conditions that you have for the preconditions and post-conditions, they have to be pure expressions, okay? Uh, and I don't expect us to demand that a compiler proves that an expression is pure, but if that is the wish of the community, we can get it. We know how to do context per functions, so we have a good idea about how to do pure expressions, but the idea is to be simple. Um, so um, for exceptions, we expect the, the expressions to not throw ex exceptions. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Uh, yeah, so we don't for this proposal. The idea is that post condition is what you guarantee on a successful return. When you raise an exception, you never go back uh, through exception return. You take an exceptional path. So you're not back to the call site. You're somewhere else. Uh, last question. Uh, yes. Um, mm hmm so the, in, this, in this vision, we want something that is simple. So your uh, post condition is a guarantee that you give to the, uh, to the caller. The caller has no clue how you structure the body of a function. So if you're going to have several return statement, just make sure that what you state uh, in the post condition is the abstract, the thing that people care about, not how it is actually implemented. Yes. How do you unit test those contracts? Uh, those contract? I suppose it depends a bit on your testing framework. 
but I've heard a lot of suggestions. I know Biane would like to test, uh, you know, to do unit tests based on the exceptions. And other folks just run and, you know, have a monitor on the side that look at the, uh, uh, the, the states, you know, which run a program where it terminates normally or abnormally and, and, and so forth. But I don't have any more general uh, answer than that. No, the idea is that when uh, a, a call is out of contract, meaning you, know, you make a call, but the arguments do not you know, meet the contract, then instead of aborting a contract, you could, you know, the system, the compiler, the runtime system, could throw an exception, given it's a contract violation. That's it. You don't you need to test the contract, you need to test the function, the operation. Did, did I answer your question? <laughs> okay, let's call it a day. <laughs> Thank you.